Hello, I'm Sid Agass, and this is an unnamed horror podcast that I, I honestly should have thought of a name for before I hit play, but I just thought I should just, just do it. So this is happening mostly because I need a, a long-form uh, medium for which I can I can talk about J-horror, because I noticed that's a lot of the stuff that I kind of consume, um, because I love it. I'm about that life. You know how there's a dude out there that just reads, like, Big Titty Harem, <laughs> Big Titty Harem anime, or, you know, the guy that just reads, like, Naruto, or, you know, anime about punching guys. I'm the, I'm the dude that, uh, that, you know, if it's spooky, like, let me at it. And that extends up to and including, like, film, too. So, uh, this, this is gonna serve as a, as a way for me to, uh, talk about this long form, because I do a series called Manga Macabre, where I play a character who talks about like manga but you know it's a character so it's not the greatest fit for these sort of long form you know thoughtful exercises so uh that's enough rambling on uh today we're going to be talking about yakusoku no neverland or uh the promised neverland for for you you baka gaijins Ugh. is that is that a thing people still make fun of now i feel old i feel real old because i remember before funimation had dragon ball z Hmm. Okay, uh, so Yakusoku no Neverland uh, is getting an, an anime adaptation, and that's relative to when you're listening to this. It probably came out today or yesterday or something like that. And most of you are listening to this in the future because I don't, I don't want to keep gating these. Um, but that that means as someone who who has caught up all a hundred and something teen uh, chapters of it. Uh, the the time of me being able to smugly sit up here and go, mm, yes, well, uh, you should read the manga because the anime doesn't exist yet. Uh, the sun is setting on that, much like with JoJo and much like with Doro Hidoro. Again, I'm dating these, but I'm dating him in the future, actually, for Doro Hidoro. The, the sun is setting, and also I also just want to... Uh, let people know what this is, because if even one person listens to this and, like, checks out this series, um, because the anime was, like, really bad in the future, uh, then, you know, I've, I've done my job. I've done my job. All right, so let's just, um, go on in, because I, I'm really bad at banter, which is, you know, why I don't have any friends. So it's a real good anime, and it, or it's, well, I don't know if it's a good anime, it might be shit, uh, so, but it's a real good manga, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And I think as of right now, it's sort of entering its its the beginning of its third act, I suppose. And I'm I'm gonna spoil the shit out of this one. All right, I'm just gonna spoil this one. <laughs> so you know, if you're listening to this in the present, uh oh, or hopefully you're one of those people that are more about the the journey than the destination, because I know I certainly am. And I'm guessing the anime is probably gonna be about like the first thirty five chapters or so. Uh, but let's just jump on in. And I'll save everything past the first arc for, you know, a little later in the show. <sighs> cool. So, we have 37 or so orphans, and our main character, Emma, who's like this fiery, you know, big-brained, uh, girl. <laughs> because you know girls, right? Of course you do. You're not a gamer's rise up. And, you know, her and the other orphans, because they're all orphans, um... They're like siblings, and life is cool, and they have a, a loving mother figure and a lot of free time, and all these kids are, relative for children, pretty pretty damn smart. Like, they seem to have a pretty solid education, uh, great food, Every everything, for, for lack of a better word, is lit. And the kids of the orphanage, which is called the, the Grace Field Orphanage, are, are basically, like, the future chads. Like, they're they're the future big-brained uh, Bill Nyes. You're, um... I don't know, who's another... Who's another smart guy? Uh, you're, you're Professor Oaks of the future, right? Like, you're astronauts, you're doctors, etc. And you may be thinking, oh, okay, well, you said this was a... <laughs> this was a horror podcast, so, like, what's the catch? Because everything can't be going cool forever. And you, you be right. Um... So one day, like, the mother character comes back in and says, Hey, Connie, who's, like, one of the kids, uh, we have a family that wants to adopt you. Okay, well, that's pretty rad. All right, let, see, let, see you guys later. Best of luck. See you later. Uh, so long. Thanks for all the fish. So Emma and her, uh, and her like, I, I guess, uh, I don't want to say sidekick, but, like, best buddy 
uh, strictly platonic, but actually not really, because he has a one-sided crush Norman, uh, go and say, hey, hold up, you forgot your stuffed animal, you know, you're probably never coming back here, so I know we shouldn't, you know, we've been told not to leave the, you know, gated off part of the orphanage, but, you know, this is a special occasion, never gonna happen again. So this is about where, like, Emma and Norman's life gets flip-turned upside down, and I'd like to take a moment to sit right there and tell you uh, about how Emma and Norman find uh, Connie's lifeless corpse with the flower sticking out. And if you're thinking, oh, yeah, well, you know, that makes sense, because, you know, fucked up stuff happens, well, here you go. <laughs> uh, so as it turns out, uh, the children of the Grace Hill Orphanage are being uh, raised uh, as high-end livestock to be, like, sold off to demons and, and fed as, as basically food. Uh, kind of like Kobe beef, um, but for, but for like, humans, where, you know, uh, the better your upbringing or, you know, the smarter and more compassionate and, uh, like, just basically, like, all, more all-rounded person you are, like, the tastier you are. And Mama's in on it. So this is where things sort of get interesting. Uh, from here on, like, we know that... Um, like, Mama somehow finds out uh, that two of the kids know the secret, but she doesn't know which two. So, the entire series, well, not the entire one, but a, a good chunk of it, like the rest of this arc, and I'm guessing the anime, um, uh, it's now, like, trying to unravel the mechanisms that make Grace feel more of a prison than an orphanage. Because it's not just that they, they can't leave, because, you know, Mama is just one person. But all of the the secret mechanisms that are kind of hiding in plain daylight to uh, why they can't leave, like the, like the, the kids, all their uniforms are white uh, because they're livestock or you know they're groceries. So you need to have a way to measure you know if they're injured or something. So that's the real reason why you know it's white or. Most windows have gates on them, and you don't really think about it, but hey, it turns out, you know, the gates are there, so you can't really get out. Uh, so, the, so the race is on. So Mama, again, knows that some of the kids know, and she doesn't know which two. And if she finds out, you know, she can just have the kids shipped off at, you know, any moment to get, you know, just fed to demons. Uh, so she wants to find the kids before this becomes an issue, uh, but the kids need to measure who can they trust, because Mama is the person that, you know, they effectively thought was their mother. Like, she's been with them, like, since birth. Um, she's about, uh, I, I think she's, like, about 12 years older than the kids, I think. Um, there's a little bit of weirdness in that, because Mama is, is about 26, but the kids are between 5 and 12, or give or take. So, so this is sort of what makes Promise Neverland special, because you know how, like in JoJo or something, right, uh, the fights aren't really fights, but like psychological warfare, where they're like not competing in terms of fist, although fists do happen in JoJo, not so much in this one, but uh, uncover something really unconventional that's happening, or, you know, trying to suss out who knows what, uh, not, not like you know, who knows what is in like a ambiguous statement but like who knows this information who knows that information and like it, i'm saying like a lot because i'm from california where everything's an avocado i'm an avocado fun fact uh we have a great avocado tree that we all go to worship once every uh, uh once every year or so um if you didn't know i don't know how many of you are from california but if you're not that's what we do um so yeah, in, in Promise Neverland, there's there's a lot of those type of psychological battles, like where very arbitrary things like exactly what type of questions you ask uh, do sort of inform what you know. Like asking a little bit too detailed of a question sort of implies, hmm, there has to be a reason why you're asking that. Are you one of the kids? Or, you know, like what kids are going to believe them? Uh, because a lot of the kids, you know, again, m Mama is their mother figure. Uh, like, they're not just going to believe, oh, you know, Mama wants to kill us, right? Like, that's just going to sound like nonsense. Uh, so they also have to measure, like, okay, who's who's going to snitch? Who's going to... Wh who wants to get stitches? Because they also want to get uh, all of the kids out. Like, not just them. So it becomes a sort of prison escape. And uh, so it's, it's very fun. It's a very interesting series. Um... 
Uh, later on, there's a character named uh, Sister Klaus, I believe, or, or Sister Claus. I, I think it, I think it may have been Klaus, uh, who's like this big, muscular black woman, uh, who I think a lot of people think she's a she's a horrible stereotype. Uh, I'm. I think she's fine. Like, she's on that sort of border, but I think she's fine. Oh, for the record, I, I'm, I'm totally black. Like, I'm not like a white guy telling you, oh, yeah, that thing that's totally racist. Nah, it's, it's cool. <laughs> uh, I'm not your, uh, um, your super racist man. I'm not, I'm not your, your, I don't know, who's a racist guy? Um, one of those atheists in a suit. <laughs> I don't really know what to call them. <laughs> uh, you know the ones. Sorry if you're an atheist in a suit. You know the ones I'm talking about. Um, I hope that's not too obscure a reference because I'm, I'm throwing down a lot of a lot of real obscure, like real narrow references today. Uh, but I'm I'm just gonna trust that you all just if you didn't if you didn't get it, just not that just in general for me talking. Just just keep just roll with it. Just just laugh right now. I'll wait. Great. Did you laugh? Well, that's weird because I didn't I didn't tell a joke. So if you were in public, you look like a, a weirdo. So yeah, there's a character, uh, Sister Klaus, who's uh, really great. There's something about her story that sort of mimics uh, kind of the story of a lot of black women, where she has to work like twice as hard for a system that's kind of set up against her. But um, uh, note that Promise Neverland is is uh, interestingly in a setting where like the concept of race has been gone for like at least. 30 years or so. So it was super interesting to see a story that, like, mimics, uh, like, the, the sort of stories that you would hear from women of color, but, like, not in a really beat-you-over-the-head way. So it's it's sort of a, the kind of thing you can just keep going with and just kind of nod and go, oh, that's interesting. Kind of like, I don't know, like, gay themes in, in uh, like, Berserk or something. Uh, so that's real fun. So let's talk about those demons for a hot sec. Uh, so the demons are all, like, these characters that wear, like, a big mask, right? And they all have, like, this overlord who is, a uh, uh, you can't pronounce it. I don't know how the anime is going to mm -hmm. handle it, but, uh, it's, it's unpronounceable. It's written in that old, uh, Cthulhu text where you can't read it. Like, people are saying it, but it just looks like jumbled nonsense. Uh, and that's super neat because I love these unspeakable, unknowable names that everyone just sort of seems to know. And they come in, like, a bunch of different shapes and sizes. Uh, this is the part where I'm gonna start spoiling shit for you, so, you know, get ready. Uh, so, so the demons are all really, really fun. Like, they seem to be the, the apex thing in the Promised Neverland world, right? Um, like, they come in, I think, I think most of them don't get much shorter than about ten feet or so, from what I can tell. Like, they're all significantly larger than normal humans, but... You know the more sapient ones uh, have the have these cool masks because uh, demons all have m try to describe them actually uh, because I'm I'm doing a lot of work talking about how cool something is or how cool it looks without actually telling you because I love monsters um, in a in a platonic way I feel like I need to specify that because some people want to do monsters and that's fine good good, good on you good for you uh, I'm not here to yuck your yum I don't get paid for that someone paid me to do that though. Like, if someone paid me to yuck your yum, I'd do it. Um, unless it feels a religious thing, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, you know, saying you're going to hell for it. So the demons are really great. Uh, like, they all have multiple eyes, and their weak point is usually their center eye. Like, I guess it's sort of the, uh, um, for lack of better words, like, I, I guess the balls of, of the demons. <laughs> um... I don't know why I keep going to the not entirely safe for work there or the really crassest place possible, but I guess that's where we are. Um, and they're, well, I, I mean balls, it's, in like, it's, it's their number one weak point. I mean, I guess the eye holes are most people's <laughs> weak point, but the, the center eye is, is definitely the weakest. So they all wear these, like, sort of tribal-looking masks that are made of, like, super tough material, where, like, gunshots, you know, typically don't do a whole lot against them, or, you know, if anything at all. Uh, most of them have, like, sort of bird claw-like feet and very gangly limbs, uh, sort of like, uh, maybe the Titans, or, you know, from Attack on Titan, or, or maybe more traditional oni might, might be a better comparison like if you've ever seen like the sort of brute uh 
like the brute family from uh, uh, from Shin Megami Tensei games. Uh, they they sort of are shaped like that. Like they come in a, in a bunch of different flavors, but like usually they have sort of the the sinewy like flesh that it's a, a kind of gangly in a in a certain way, uh, and they're all really fun because some of them have like a bunch of uh, a bunch of limbs and some of them. Uh, are like just giants like some of them are just straight up giants although it seems like the giant ones are like the weakest variety because i guess in promised neverland like in that world you know the smartest are usually the ones that sort of get their way or at least like in a in a narrative sense in a narrative sense the smartest ones are the are the strongest uh so you know like a dumb animal like demon like you know they're, they're stupid like they'll, they'll eat each other like they can regenerate like all demons can regenerate but you know these guys are just you know dumb idiots they don't know to protect their faces and a lot of the the more beast like ones come in hordes which is a uh, also super duper fun <laughs> because sometimes they're sort of treated as more of like a weather condition uh than like normal like normal monsters uh, which, speaking of, a lot of the feeling that the first half of the anime gets is uh, almost fairy tale like. Um, not the not the anime, but like, oh no, they're gonna, you know, a bunch of goblins or you know, a bunch of monsters are gonna come gobble you up, kids. But like, take that broad feeling and sort of apply it to uh, like very smart something very smart like i would describe this as um i would say it has a little bit of lord of the flies quality meets like detective conan <laughs> almost with like maybe a little bit of prison break for its overall thing uh speaking of eventually the kids get out i won't spoil the exact you know the exact way but well not all some of the kids get out and they made a promise to come back for the rest of them uh, which is, you know, promises are important. Like, this is a series that is uh, very big on, like, promises. And not necessarily in a, in a weird, sappy, tacked-on way, like a Naruto, but in the sense of, like, you know, it's in, the, it's, in the, it's in the title. Like, the promised Neverland. Like, you know, words mean things. People make promises. Uh, and, like, Emma, specifically, the main character. Like, even though, you know, she's smart, like, she's in a, she's in a world where, like, all the main human characters are smart. Like, she's, you know, not... Like, she's smarter than me, probably. Uh, she knows how to get the things done. But, you know, among them, she's the least smart. But she's, like, you know, still an A student, and etc. But she's sort of the, the one where feelings mean a lot. Like, she will let the way she feels cloud her judgment. And, you know, with that, that also gives her a sort of fiery spirit of, like, not giving up. Which is uh, good. Because the world of uh, Promise Neverland... This is the part where, you know, if you super want to have the first arc not spoiled and go into the second section of it, you know, spoiler free, which, uh, oh, sure. I, I guess I advise doing that. Um, uh, the manga sort of takes a, a downturn, but it's still pretty good in sort of, and it, it becomes an adventure, uh, because everything they've been getting, uh, in the, in the Gracefield orphanage, uh, is old. Like, all of it, like, the last recorded stuff is from, like, 2015, 2016, give or take. Uh, but it is currently the year, like, 2045. Um, and concepts like race just don't exist. Like, those are just gone. Like, those are those are just fucking done for. Uh, and I think gender is also kind of done for, too, to my understanding. But Japanese is a language that is a little bit more fuzzy with that kind of thing. Yeah, so they get out and it becomes an escape. Because it turns out the World of Promise Neverland is just, like, overrun with demons. And not just, like, these things need to be eliminated. But these things have, like, organizations and, like, complicated societies like human civilizations do. Like, closer to an alien civilization than a, you know, we've been overrun. Like, and humans are, are the food. And uh, Grace, uh, Grace Field is one of a handful of, like, quote-unquote premium farms where, like, uh, this is where the uh, upper echelons of demons, like, eat. Where, you know, most, you know, normal dumb fuck demons, and by dumb fuck, I don't mean, like, the animals, I just mean, like, you know, the average Joe. Uh, they're just eating, like, mass-produced humans where it's, it's basically just clones, but they haven't quite figured out uh how to get the brain out no, no that's not true they think the brains are delicious but these brains are just non-existent like these humans can't really think or anything like that they're just food uh but but the premium farms uh that's where you know you get humans you sort of trick them into uh thinking that everything is you know pretty cool 
and life is pretty great and give them a loving upbringing uh, to make them extra super duper tasty. And, you know, when they hit about 16 or so, uh, sometimes earlier, depending on how, like, their test scores are, because, you know, the smarter a human is, the more they want to sort of keep them around longer, because, uh, you know, the more their brains develop, the tastier they are. Yeah, they just gobble you up later. And this is partially because at some point, you know, long, long ago, there was a pact between, like, humans and demons where, uh, you know, uh, humans were sort of sick of getting gobbled up and hunted and... And demons were sort of sick of, uh, you know, humans sort of fighting back. So uh, they, they made a promise to make a Neverland go figure. I don't think they use that until, like, much later, until, like, at least chapter 100 and something. Um, where, okay, tell you what, us humans, we're just going to go over here. And that's probably the regular human world that's possibly similar to what we see now. Uh, well, in real life, like, it's implied to be very similar, like, things like Game Boys and iPods, like, those things exist. Uh, and they're doing their own thing, no demons over there, to, to our knowledge, uh, with an upper echelon of, like, you know, your Donald Trumps, maybe, and your <laughs> Obamas, and your Hillary Clinton, they know about the lizard men. Uh, <laughs> or at least that's what I imagine it to be like, I don't know yet. Uh, like, they're, they're in on the, on the whole demon situation, but we don't really see much, we don't see much of them. Uh, and, you know, before they left, they said, okay, as a show of good faith, because, you know, as much as it sucks, humans eat demons. Like, it, it or, demons eat humans. It, it's just what they do. Like, it, it sucks, but we can't really blame you that much for it. So, tell you what, it's really terrible, but we're just gonna leave some of our kids here, right? Leave them here, uh... And, you know, you can just do whatever. I advise you just grow them. You just make farms and you just, you know, make more humans so you can just eat them. And, you know, that kind of sucks for, you know, those humans. But, you know, it's a promise. It's probably for the better good. Uh, but it sucks for the kids of Gracefield because, <laughs> oh shit, you're raising me as, as food. Jesus Christ. Uh... <laughs> Uh, which leads to some fun uh, demons you meet a little later on called the Heathens, which are, are sort of a religious sect, where their whole thing is that, you know, this promise that, you know, the humans and demons made, it's kind of sucks, because it's not just the the fact that humans are tasty, but, um, like, it's also fun to hunt them. Like, it's, you know, it's just what demons do. This is like, you know, telling them not to, uh, uh, not to, you know, like like telling a tiger not to hunt. Uh, so, uh, some people just said, and by people I mean teams, of course, just said, okay, tell you what, I, I don't like this pact, I'm not even gonna eat any of these gross, you know, domesticated humans, I want some wild humans, so, occasionally they'll bump into, like, a demon that says, you know what, just, just go on, they're sort of like the, the, well, religious versions of vegans, like, you know, go about your day, and hopefully, you know, one day, you humans will be free enough to where you get old enough to have kids, and those kids won't be born on farms, therefore, they're wild humans, which means we can eat them. So, uh, they're not, you know, entirely hopeless. And, you know, they meet other humans much, much, much later on, uh, who sort of, you know, have been strong enough to, you know, beat demons, leading to probably one of my favorite shonen arcs in general, the, um... Uh, the uh, Goldie Pond arc, where, you know, they, they think there's a big human thing at a place called Goldie Pond. So, so they go there, only to find out that Goldie Pond has, like, long, long ago been overrun by demons, and, you know, it's fucked now. It's done for. Uh, and, you know, the, the demon, the upper-ranked demon guys have just sort of made a, a most dangerous game-style park where, uh, you know, they, they kidnap humans from usually the premium farm, because those are the only humans that are capable of, like, speech. Um, and just put them in this, in this little town area and just say, All right, humans, every three days or so, we're just going to run in and just murder as many of you as we can. And it's like a fun game to them. Uh, most of the hunters are, are just, you know, I, I don't want to say weak, but, you know, they, they don't really think the humans are going to fight back. Like, they, they give them guns, but... You know, some of them are just pop guns and air guns and stuff. And, uh, you know, bullets are a little scarce. And, you know, like I was saying before, bullets don't work particularly well against, you know, demons. Like, they work, but, you know, you need, you need, you need a lot of them to take down a demon. There are also a bunch of them. So, you know, really this is just a show of, you know, 
okay, here's a knife. I'm coming for you with, you know, my AK-47. Except for this one guy, uh, uh, Count Duke something. Uh, I don't, I don't remember his name. Grand Duke something. I don't remember his name. He's a great character. He looks like Vampire Hunter D. He looks like a demon cosplaying as Vampire Hunter D. And he's a character that, you know, he wants to fight a human that, like, can't, is capable of fighting back. Because most of these guys are just scared shitless and just run away. He wants one that, you know, it's full of fire energy. And, you know, he meets, um... Uh, Emma, who, you know, is, you know, our token sort of shonen protagonist, and, uh, and they have it out, where Emma is desperately trying to figure out a way to fight these fellas, because she's super duper big brain Chad. <laughs> the, the, the grand count here would, uh, like, he, he's a hunter, so much so that, you know, while Emma's thinking of a plan, part of her plan is just contingent on having more time, and she's not really able to evade him for very long, so she just says, okay, tell you what, and sort of takes advantage of his, like, good sportsmanship, like, in a hunting way, like, hunter nature, and just says, okay, tell you what, tell you what, you want to fight me so hard, give me ten minutes, and I'll give you a great show, and he says, you know what? That's fine. <laughs> and towards the end of this, it looks like the plan has fallen apart. And she just says, hey, um, tell you what, uh, I I don't really have anything against you. Like, I mean, I, I know you, you, you know, kidnap people and, you know, you kill them. But, you know, that that's just what you do. But outside of that, I don't have any personal reason to want to kill you. Um, especially if you just let me go. So how about you just let me go? <laughs> and he just says uh, something effective like, listen... That's very sweet of you, and I understand, but that's just not how it is. It's not how it's going to be. Personally, if you had a plan to, like, murder me in cold blood, I would rather you do that one and you, you know, you guys kill me with a fight than, you know, we just go our separate ways. So I just thought it was very interesting how, you know, for the first time, I think in, in many ages, a character just sits down and says, okay, listen, yeah... I, that's a good plan, but I, I'm i not going to do it. We still have to fight. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. And you may be thinking, ah, oh, that doesn't really sound very horror-like. Uh, but this one is, is very similar. Like, after the first sort of prison break arc, where it's like a thriller, it becomes a horror that's much closer to the drifting classroom, uh, which is one that we're going to have to talk about later. Uh, but in the sense of, like, you know, this is the story of a sort of Walking Dead style, you know, done for world where, you know, every everything about it just screams give up. There is no reason to keep going. Uh, there is, you know, very much reason to, you know, rat out your fellow person and just, you know, watch them die and just, you know, live out your meager little life, you know, hoping that no one sees you or, you know, just at every like every single turn there's something else stopping you and not really in a thrilling sense but in a you know a very depressing sense where like the entire world just becomes the antagonist like there is a central antagonist but you know it doesn't feel like it it just feels like you know this is just how life is now uh like what's gonna be next is someone gonna get sick is someone gonna get the plague is uh are we gonna get caught and lose half our dudes uh, because things do generally um get significantly worse. Uh, although, unlike, um, uh, unlike its contemporaries, which, oh, what's that, what's that one I referenced before with the fly? Um, with the island and the kids. I don't remember. Island of Flies. I don't think that was it. Well, I'm just gonna keep saying Drifting Classroom because that's the one I know and you guys can probably know the movie. You know the movie, the British one where the kids kill each other. This is very similar to that, but, like, what if everyone was smart, and everyone was sort of, uh, I, I don't want to say meta, but, like, they all sort of have a mutual understanding that, you know, we're in this together, in a sense. So it sort of plays out as a variant on, on those type of stories, where there's always this push and pull of, like, you know, we have pretty solid evidence that um, working together, you know, is good, but we're not really, you know, entirely sure to what degree. Again, sort of like Walking Dead, where, you know, it's good to have a group of people you can trust, but can you really trust everyone? Especially, you know, when you come into a situation entirely ignorant. Like, this isn't 
a world where the rules have suddenly been flipped on you, but one where you realize that the rules that you thought were the case are just, you know, not that at all. So, uh, yeah, Promise Neverland is, is really something special, and uh, not entirely for the faint of heart, uh, which is, goes for a lot of things we're probably going to talk about, which is um, really interesting, because you can totally read this one on the Shonen Jump app, and it's, like, quietly tucked away between Naruto and Dragon Ball Z, which are generally uh, pretty wholesome. Um, okay, uh, next week we're going to talk about, um, I don't know, uh, something else kind of kind of spooky. Uh Eventually we'll talk about a movie, but next week we're probably going to do more anime. Uh, so until until next time, uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, leave a nice comment or don't. Either one's fine. I don't want to make you do anything you don't want to do. Uh, but maybe comment on something you you know enjoy seeing me talk about. Subscribe wherever I I post this. I'm probably going to post it on the YouTube channel and then post it uh, somewhere where you can listen to it on the go, because that's what podcasts are good for. And uh, uh, like me on, um, <laughs> uh, I feel so lame doing that, but you know, that's how it is now. Sometimes, you know, you actually, you genuinely do want to keep up with things you enjoy. Uh, find me at Sidagast at Twitter and, uh, Manga Macabre at Tumblr. Okay, great. So I, I shit, well, I, I don't know how to end this. Uh, yeah, and also, you know, continue to subscribe, uh, because I also do a series called Manga Macabre, where I, uh, do more of a short-form thing, playing a character of the host who sort of, like, um, uh, think the Night Vale Anime Club is, is what I would sort of describe it as, where we mostly talk about horror manga, uh, which will be coming off of, um, a, another hiatus in the next couple of days. So, uh, until next time, I've been your host, Sidagast, and, uh, I hopefully have thought of a name by then. <laughs>